In this video, we're going to talk about Turing machines and how we can use them to recognize languages. So how we can use them to decide whether or not a particular string is in a language or not, just like we did with the finite state machines and the pushdown automata. All you will need for this video is an understanding of the Turing machine definition and also um, familiarity with the macro language that we've talked about in class that we can use to describe Turing machines in a much nicer way than the full tuple definition with finite state machines. So we'll start with some conventions and then I'll give a, a summary of what the next two videos are basically going to conclude. So our convention when we want to use a Turing machine to start trying to decide if a string is in a language will be to write the string on the tape before to have the string on the tape before the Turing machine starts operating. So we can assume that there's something there that puts the string on the tape. And then we'll make sure that everything to the left and right of the string is just blanks. Now obviously we know that the input alphabet never contains a blank. So obviously there are no blanks in this string W. We then have the initial configuration of our Turing machine. So remember, the initial configuration is the start state paired with whatever is on the tape before the Turing machine runs and the position of the tape head. So the, the initial configuration for a Turing machine to try to decide a late whether or not a string is in a language will be in the start state, obviously, and then one space to the left of the input string on the tape. So just like with the finite state machines and the pushdown automata that we've already discussed, we'd like to be able to take a particular language and then design a Turing machine for that language which can tell us for any arbitrary W made up from the alphabet of that language is that string in the language. Now obviously that is going to be true for the regular languages since the, the uh, finite state machine can easily simulate, uh, sorry since a Turing machine can easily simulate a finite state machine. And we, we can see as well that we can simulate a pushdown automata using a Turing machine. So it's obviously trivially true that we can do this for any regular or context-free language. And we also show that we can do this for some other languages which not even the pushdown automata were powerful enough for, such as AMB and CN. And there are lots of other languages that we can decide using a Turing machine that we can't handle with the regular context-free formalisms. However, one of the things that we're going to conclude at the very end of this is that there are still languages which the power of this Turing machine, which is the most powerful formalism we know we have to date, is still not enough to decide those languages. So now we'll define what it means for a Turing machine to either accept or reject a string. So like before, we have the concept of sort of accepting states. Um, which in this case we will have one halting state which is a yes state and we have one halting state which is a no state which we've defined before. We say that a Turing machine accepts W if when we start with the configuration, the initial configuration where W is on the tape, we eventually yield a configuration where we are in that accepting state. Why? Regardless, for, for any particular string that might be left on the tape, we don't really care about that. We call a configuration where we are in that final um, halting accepting state and accepting configuration. So obviously there's an analogous rejecting configuration in the rejecting halting state that we have. And we say that a Turing machine rejects a string W if we start with W on the tape in, an initial, in our initial configuration and we eventually yield um, an, a rejecting configuration. Now note that we haven't said anything about whether or not it's possible for Turing machines to guarantee to be in one of these or the other, or even whether it's possible for a Turing machine to non-deterministically end up in both. But we do say that M accepts a string in this case, and we say that it rejects a string in this case. Now remember from very early on in the course, we defined the idea of deciding as telling us yes or no to answering whether or not a string is in a language. So we say that a machine, a Turing machine, decides a language, if and only if, for every possible input string, then if that string is in the language, M accepts the string, and if the 
um, string is not in the language, then our Turing machine rejects. And those are according to our previous definitions of accept and reject. We say that the language is decidable if and only if there's a Turing machine which can decide it. So it, our definition of a decidable language is a language that we can build a Turing machine for that language which satisfies this requirement here. And we will denote the set of all decidable languages using uppercase D, just like we've talked about before about the set of all regular languages, the set of all context-free languages. We now have a larger set of all of the languages for which we can build Turing machines which always halt and which accept if the string is in the language and reject if the string is not in the language. Now, to give an example of uh, following through a Turing machine and deciding a language, we're going to use this example that I've given down here, and we're going to talk about one string that's in the language, and we're going to talk about one string that's not in the language. Now, there's not enough time in this video for me to go through the methods for designing such a Turing machine. Um, I would recommend, however, that once you've finished this little particular example, you pause the video and try a few other strings that you can make. Now, remember, the initial configuration that we deal with is something made up from the alphabet of the language, which in this case is just A's, B's and C's, where we have the tape head starting on the blank to the left of that, and then a string made up from that language with no gaps, and then a blank tape to the right of that. So we have a Turing machine here, which you'll have to press the I believe button, uh, unless you can recognize that it does indeed decide A and B and C and, and we're going to follow through these two examples. Our first example string is one that is in the language, made up of two A's, two B's and two C's. Our machine starts with the tape head here, and the first thing it does in our macro language is moves one to the right. So now the tape head is here. Because it has seen an A, it follows this transition here, at which point it writes a 1. So we're using 1s as markers to indicate A's that we have already seen. Then we move right 1 again, so we're looking here, and what because we've seen an A, we follow this loop transition. So obviously, while ever we're seeing A's, we're going to keep looping in the right until our tape head is somewhere that we're not seeing either an A or a 2. Now, there's no 2s on the tape yet, but we'll worry about that later. If what we see is a B, we write a 2. In this case, that's what we're seeing here. So we're marking off this B as a 2. So some of you might already be able to see how this machine is doing what it's doing. It's moving through, finding a 1, moving through any seen A's, or, sorry, unseen A's or seen B's, which are A's and 2's, until it finds another B that it can match. Now it keeps looping right again while ever it sees a B, so it moves until this point here, at which point it sees a C and follows this transition here. And it writes a 3 where the tape head currently is, and now it's marked off a C. Now, because we are at this point here, we simply move left into a blank, so our tape head will now be back over here. We follow this transition here, which has no condition on it, and then we move right again. So we'll move right, and now we'll be under this 1. Now, while ever we see a 1, we're going to keep, keep moving right. So we move right, and now we see an A. We follow that transition and we do exactly the same thing again. We see the A, we mark it off with a 1. We move right while ever we see A's or 2's. So because we've already seen this 2, we're going to end up over here on this B. We see a B, mark it off with a 2. Move right while ever we see um, more B's or the, the 3's that we've already marked C's off with until we get to this point here, at which point we'll mark it off with a 3. And then move left until the blank again. At this point, we move right, and what we see, while ever we see 1s, and then we eventually see a 2. So we follow this transition down here instead. So this is just the transition that um, checks that we haven't snapped something up by having extra Cs on the end of the string. So this transition moves right while ever we see things that we've already marked off, that are 2s and 3s, as long as they're not a, As that we've marked off. And if we ever see an A, B, a C, or an, un, or an already marked off A, we reject. But in this case, we eventually get down to this blank here, at which point we tr um, follow this transition here, and we end up in an accepting configuration. And notice how we may have something sitting on the, on the tape here, but that's not important. Now, I know I'm rushing through this, but this video is already quite packed. Now, we're going to discuss a string for the same Turing machine, but where the string is not in the language, and we're going to watch how we end up in a rejecting configuration. 
So in this case, we start here with our tape head um, on the left, blank to the left of the input string. We move right and we see an A. So we replace that A with a 1. We move right while ever we see A's, so we end up over here. And at this point, what we see is a C. So we can't follow this transition over here that we were following before. Now we end up following this transition here. So it's immediately seen that we don't have a string where there are B's immediately after the A's. So it knows already that we can end up in a rejecting configuration. And this machine halts and rejects. Now we have this unprocessed string again on the tape, but like I said before, that's not particularly important for accepting and rejecting. We're going to move on with another another example, but what I would recommend you doing is just rewinding the video a little bit and pausing with that Turing machine definition on the screen, and then coming up with a few other strings and tracing through how that Turing machine works until you understand all of the parts that you can see there down in the macro language, because that's one easy way to start to understand them and to move in the initial steps of being able to design your own Turing machines, which is an outcome expected of this course. This machine here is going to be a machine that decides another non-context-free language. The language is um, where we have repetitions of a string, but we're going to have a C in the middle. So we've got strings made of A's and B's with a C in the middle, but where the first part has to match the second part. Again, we're going to go through an, um, two example strings, one which is a yes instance and one which is a no instance. And again, I would recommend that after you've done this, after you've watched this, you go back through a few other examples to see if you can go through any parts that we might not traverse during these examples. So our first example here is going to be a string which is in the language, and we can see that we have A, B, B before and after a C. Now this Turing machine is going to make use of a few more slightly advanced macro language concepts, um, and it's going to end up being slightly simpler than the equivalent language would have been, uh, equivalent machine would have been if we didn't use these concepts. So we start, our tape head is again on the blank to the left of the string, and we move right. At this point, we have the option of transitioning if we see a C, which we don't have. We see a blank, which we don't have. Or we see an A or a B, and this is a transition on either an A or a B, but it will store whichever of those it sees in a little variable called X. And we can use these uh, finite variable storages in Turing machines easily, because we can simulate them either using um, uh, other, other advanced concepts that we'll talk about later or um, states in the finite state, underlying finite state machine. So our x variable ends up being having a stored in it and then we blank out the a. So notice in this case, unlike before, we're not marking off the things that we've seen with special holding characters, we're just blanking them out. Now we move right here, and this is another little subroutine that moves right until we see a C or a blank. So in this case, we'll end up here because we've seen a C first, and then we follow this transition down here, at which point we move right until we see something which is not a hash. So anything, any symbol on the tape other than a hash, and this notation says that we are going to, when we do so, store it in a variable Y. So we move right once, and what we see is an A, which is not a hash, so we're going to store that in our variable Y. At this point here, we have a conditional um, branch either here or down here, and it's based on our variables that we've stored. So our variables are equal, Y is equal to um, X in this case. So over here, we end up writing a hash over the top of the A, and then we move left until a blank, which is going to actually move us down here into this blank, which was originally an A. And then we move back up to the start of the machine. At this point, we move right. This time we see a B. So B gets stored in our X variable. We blank it off, like before. And then again, we move right until we see a C or a blank, in this case, we're going to see the same C that we saw before. Then we are going to move right until we see something that is not a hash. Now this time we have written hashes on the tape, so this little move right until we see something that isn't a hash makes a little bit more sense. We're going to be over here seeing a B. In that case, this gets stored in the Y variable, and we take the branch that says Y and X contain the same symbols.
we hat mark off our B with a hash, and then we transition back up to the start. So you can see how this is working. It moves over, it stores the next thing in the left side of the C, it moves until it finds the C, and then it moves until it finds the next thing that it needs to, that it hasn't already compared, and checks if it's the same. So we're going to, we're back over here underneath this new blank here. We move right and store the, what we see in our variable, which is again another B, so X remains unchanged. We blank it off, and then we move right until we see a C or a blank, which is just going to put us here. At this point, we move right until we see something that isn't a hash, which is the, sec the last B, and that gets stored in Y, and then we take the same transition that we have before, mark our B off with a hash, and then move up, back up, move left until we see a blank, which this time is going to be the blank just to the left of the C, and transition back up to the start. At this point, we move right, and what we see is the symbol C, so we follow this transition down here. Now this transition just checks and makes sure that everything after the C is a hash, because anything that's a hash has been successfully paired off before. So as long as we don't have anything that's not hashes, we're fine. So we move right until we see something that's not a hash, and we move over here. If what we see is anything other than a blank, we will reject, but in this case what we see is a blank, so we end up down in the accepting configuration. Just like before, we're going to discuss an example where we end up rejecting. So in this case, we start off again with a tape head on the blank to the left of the string. Our Turing machine moves right one. It sees an A or a B, in this case an A, and stores that in the X variable. Then it blanks out that A. Actually, I do that this way. It blanks out the A, and then it moves right until it sees a C or a blank. Now you can tell here that if what it had done is moved, if there was no C in the string, it would move over and immediately reject using this transition here. But this isn't happening in this example. So we see a C and we move over here. We move right until we see something that isn't a hash, so that's just the A here. Store that in the Y variable. And then it will do the same thing as it did before. It will be marking this A off with a hash and then moving left until blank which in this case is back over here, one left to the C, and then starting again. In this case, it moves right, and it's straight away seeing a C now, so it follows this transition down here, at which point it moves right until it sees something that isn't a hash. Now, in this case, that's going to be moving right until it sees this B, just over here, at which point what it sees is not a blank, and then we end up rejecting. Now, you can see also, if we had seen another symbol, but for instance it had been an A, we would have eventually followed this path over here and our Y and X would not match, in which case we would reject. And there's some other ways for things to happen like this transition and this transition here. And I would re recommend pausing this video back when you can still read the macro language Turing, without all of, Turing machine without all of my scribble on it. And think about if you can figure out some strings that follow all of the different paths here until you understand exactly what's going on with this Turing machine here, because coming up with Turing machines for simple languages like this is definitely an outcome of the course. So what we've, we should have gotten from this video is our definitions of what it means for a Turing machine to accept or reject a string, what it means for a Turing machine to decide a language, what the set of all decidable languages is and what it means for a language to be decidable and an idea of how to follow how a Turing machine actually goes about doing that for some specific examples.